Can I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks. Here. Councilmember Botworth. Here. And Vice Mayor Peterson. Here. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much. Uh, tonight's meeting is being cable cast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed live from our city's website, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. Thank you for being here. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting, and if you come for public comment, please sign your name on the sheet at the podium to confirm uh, spelling for the record. All right. Um, we are gonna start with some presentations. Um, the first one, and item 2A, is a recognition of some outgoing uh, board members from the Historical Museum Board. I don't believe they were able to attend tonight. Is that correct? That is. That is correct, all right. But we do want to um, say thank you and honor Rebecca Hobson and Georgette Neal for their service on our Capitola Historical Museum Board. Um, and we will make sure that they receive um, their recognition for the work that they've done for our city and for our museum. Uh, another presentation tonight is a proclamation honoring Roberta Bristol on her 95th birthday. <laughs> Roberta, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, it's so good you came down because I can't hear well. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Well, we are here to honor you tonight on your 95th birthday. And I was reading through the proclamation, and I'm so impressed with everything that you have accomplished. And I can only hope to have that kind of lifelong resume when I turn 95. Um, you know, to hear that you were a founding faculty member at Community um, uh, uh, Cabrillo Community College, uh, counselor and dean of students there, um, that you um, mentored and nurtured dance instructors, performers, literally thousands of students, um, and successfully lobbied for yoga to be included in the curriculum. Um, it's, it's just incredible. And so I want to read to you part of the proclamation um, honoring you here on your 95th birthday tonight. So it reads in part, Whereas 26-year Capitola resident Roberta Bristol will celebrate her 95th birthday on June 29th, 2019, marking another milestone in a life that has left its mark on our community. And whereas Miss Bristol planted the seeds of creativity in so many area residents, modeling a joie de vivre, how to live a creative life and to build community. Now, therefore, I, Kristen Peterson, Vice Mayor of the City of Capitola, on behalf of the City Council, City staff, and the entire Capitola community, do hereby honor and congratulate Roberta Bristol on her 95 years. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Tandy to, to read this poem I wrote. It says a lot about how I've been blessed to, to, uh, to come to Capitola and to work at Cabrillo and the community. Thank you. The poem is titled, I Didn't Know I Would Fall in Love Again by Roberta. <laughs> what I didn't know when I moved to Santa Cruz in September 1959 was that I would find a home where I would live the rest of my life. I didn't know I would find my life work and be totally happy, creatively engaged in the adventure of living 
openly accepting what comes. Each day, I find an adventure with ordinary things like exercise, meditating, writing, reading, and taking nature walks. I didn't know when I slowed down and did one thing at a time, I would give up stress and begin to see that everything begins and ends in its own time. I've learned to stop and take a nap when my energy fades. I didn't know that when I gave up opinions and judgments, I would feel liberated from attitudes of wrong and right. I now feel free to enjoy others, making them where they are, meeting them where they are. I didn't know when I began to lose my hearing, I would learn to be more attentive to others and what they are saying. In a way, I've begun to grow back my ears by caring more, caring more to listening carefully to what others have to say. I didn't know I would find a dynamic zest for life itself in knowing I could solve difficulties and problems, and I trust my own intelligence. Sometimes this means I need to ask for help from others or talk it over with loyal friends. What I didn't know has made me fall in love again, not with romance and one person or one idea, but rather with the power of life itself which blooms each day when good seeds are planted. Thank you, Roberta. Wonderful. All right, we're gonna move right along. Can we get a report on closed session? Yes, the city council met and discussed one existing litigation item and one significant exposure item. No reportable action was taken. Thank you. Uh, item four, are there any additional materials uh, for tonight's agenda? Quite a few. Um, we have for item 10A, we received three items of public comment. For item 10B, we have one item of um, a formal assessment um, contesting, letter contesting the assessments. For item 10C, we have a memo uh, which includes two new additional um, material items related to the zoning code and the Coastal Commission update. For item 10D, we have a revised policy. And for item 10E, we have the revised salary schedule. All right, thank you. Uh, item five, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Madam Mayor, staff has one suggested change for item 10E this evening, consider a, consider a resolution for the levy of the BIA assessment. Uh, due to a noticing error, staff would recommend continuing this item to the July City Council meeting. Okay, and do you need us uh, to vote on that or is it consensus? That would be best, to vote. A vote, okay, we'll entertain a motion. I'll move to postpone item 10B to our next meeting. Second. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Uh, item 10B will be continued. All right, we're moving on to item six, public comment. Now is the time for members of the public to address the council on any items not on tonight's agenda. Please come on up to the podium. Uh, sign your name if you'd like it spelled correctly in the minutes. Good evening, Vice Mayor and Council members. Uh, my name is Susan Westman and I live in the Riverview Historical District and my request tonight is that when the city has projects that come to you for approval that are within that district that could have an impact on whether or not the district is continued, I would like to see you notice the people who all the people who live within that historic district so that we have an opportunity to look at what's being considered and comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good evening, council members. Pam Greninger. And I, I'm coming just because I wanted to um, 
in case you weren't aware, uh, we lost Noel Smith. Noel Smith was the editor for the Capitola SoCal Times and a good friend, and uh, I'm getting a little emotional, but um, I just wanted to see if maybe tonight you could adjourn tonight's meeting in his memory. Uh, he served as editor on the, um, with the Times Publishing Group, and he, I have to tell you, when I was a city clerk and also in my capacity as a secretary for the museum, Noel was always willing and wanting to uh, get articles in the paper to promote either the opening of the museum or candidates that were running for office. And uh, anyway, we're going to miss him. But uh, I just thought I'd uh, make you aware of that. And perhaps um, if you could adjourn in his memory, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we will move along to city council and staff comments. Uh, Councilmember Bator, do you have any comments tonight? I have nothing tonight. No. Nope. Councilwoman Brooks? I do. Um, I would just like to ask staff if they can um, check in with our environmental commission to see if they can possibly take on looking at where we are with our plastics policy. Maybe ask them to me and discuss that okay thanks all right and i have no comments tonight staff any comments i just want to take a quick moment to thank um assembly member mark stone and governor newsom who today signed the state budget which solidifies our two million dollars for the capitola wharf so really great day happy to see i know we announced at the last meeting but today it got finalized and it's it's a done deal so it's good a good news. day for capitola all right great news thank you all right, moving right along, item eight, boards, commissions, and committees appointments. We've got some consideration of historical museum board appointments. Do we have a staff report? Yes, Madam Vice Mayor. We have um, four openings on the historical museum board, three of which um, are in front of you tonight. Uh, two of those are for reappointment of Nels Kissling and Gordon Van Zyden, and we also, um, by recommendation of the trustees, have um, Emmy Lynn Mitchell, um, for her first, we would hope, three-year term. Um, the fourth position remained open, although they have a new applicant, and we'll be um, interviewing for that position next at their meeting next week, and it will come to you in July. So in front of you tonight are these three for a full three-year terms. Great, thank you. Any council questions? No, seeing none. Any uh, members of the public like to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for council discussion. I've read the application's motion to approve a, re a reappointment. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Congratulations to those continuing. Welcome to those uh, new to the museum board. Thank you for what you do for the museum. We appreciate it. All right, we're moving on to item nine, our consent calendar. Uh, these items are all enacted by one motion. Uh, members of the public and city council members can pull an item for separate discussion. Is there any member of the public that would like to pull an item from the consent agenda? Seeing none, is there any members of the council that would like to pull an item from the consent agenda? I'd just like to make a comment about um, consent item 9D, that there was a error on page 88. Um, it states that Anthony Condotti is our city attorney at this time, but we have somebody else in his place. So I'd like to make a motion with that amendment. I'll second that. It, the paperwork has already been corrected. Thank you. <laughs> Reed is signing it. Okay. All right, motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Fantastic. Moving right along. Um, we are on to item 10, general government, public hearings. Uh, 10A, introducing an ordinance pertaining to prohibiting sales of flavored tobacco products. Staff report. Hello, Chief. Good evening, Vice Mayor Peterson, Council Members. The item before you this evening is the uh, introduction of an ordinance amending Title 8 of the Capitola Municipal Code and adding Chapter 538, a tobacco retail license program, uh, in addition to a prohibition on the sale of flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco products. Captain Andy Daly, Daly, who's sitting at the staff table, is going to do a presentation by way of a PowerPoint, a uh, series of uh, slides in a PowerPoint. 
at the conclusion of the presentation, both Captain Daly and myself will be available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, uh, Vice Mayor and Council. <clears throat> We're here tonight, um, and let me just provide some background. On uh, March 28th, uh, Council gave us direction to research options uh, banning uh, flavored e-cigarettes and f uh, vaping products in Capitola. Um, we pr produced a report, and on April 25th, <clears throat> Council directed staff to do these three things. Prepare an ordinance creating Capitola Muni Code 5.30, which is a tobacco retail license. And what that does is regulates the sales of tobacco in Capitola, including banning the sale of all flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco products. The second uh, item was uh, recommending moving language from the Muni Code 8.30.120, which was actually a part of a, um, it was a ban on smoking and that was not the, the appropriate uh, area for that and moving it in, into chapter five. And then the final um, update was regarding just some of the language um, as far as the age limits, moving it from it was 18 years old to the, to the new uh, law being 21 and also changing some of the language as far as uh, from minor to, to the youth. And some of the information that was provided at that uh, April meeting was uh, from the uh, the 2016 Santa Cruz County survey um, <clears throat> and this this information was from the 2016 healthy stores for a, a healthy community store observations and it, it focused on focused on uh, how the uh, flavored tobacco gets uh, <clears throat> basically uh, the advertising is, is focused towards towards the youth. And so uh, the availability of e-cigarettes has increased for, in Santa Cruz County from 34% of stores in 2013 to 57% in 2016. 63% um, of those stores sell flavored non-cigarette products, which often have a kid appealing uh, flavor, such as grape, watermelon, gummy bear. And 84% of those stores also uh, sell menthol cigarettes, which is, would be a part of the, the flavored tobacco. 60% <clears throat> of the stores sell uh, uh, flavored non-cigarette tobacco products and 16% of the stores uh, place tobacco ads in kid-friendly locations um, much as they do with like candy products. Uh, just as, as far as for the city of Capitola, we currently have uh, 16 t cigarette and tobacco retailers in Capitola. They're highlighted with the red dots. Um, primarily on the 41st Avenue corridor. <clears throat> um, all of those tobacco retailers, I actually personally drove and handed them a copy of the proposed uh, ad addition or the, the proposed ordinance along with uh, the information repealing the, the, uh, the stuff out of the 8.30. Um, <clears throat> they'd also contained a cover letter explaining the public hearing was gonna be here tonight. So the, the purpose of the tobacco retail license program is to gain compliance with tobacco retailers. Um, section 5.38.010 uh, contains specific language that's in your packet regarding the te what a tobacco retailer is, uh, exactly what flavored tobacco products are, and tobacco paraphernalia. Uh, issues, license are issued on an annual basis, so it would be from January 1 all the way through December 31st, and they would have to be renewed. And then I wanted to point out that section 5.38.030 subsection C states that it shall be a violation of this chapter, chapter for any tobacco retailer or any tobacco retailer agent or employees to sell or offer to sell or to possess with intent to sell or offer to sell any flavored tobacco or any flavored tobacco products. So essentially it would be a ban on all flavored tobacco and flavored tobacco products. Uh, with regards to the, the fee schedule in Santa Cruz County, there's a, it's kind of a, a varying. We have the low end at, with, at, at about $98 to the high end of about $450. Um, we have to do some uh, internal uh, process to, to, to determine exactly what the rate would be, but we think it's gonna be within $100 or $200 for the retail license. <clears throat> and part of that will be to evaluate 
uh, what time it'll take uh, for staff to manage the program. And then uh, we're also asking that, uh, that this law would take, take place effective January 1, 2020. And what that does is that gives the retailers enough notice um, to, if they do have product to either um, not order more or to relocate it in another store or to, to sell off what merchandise that they have. And this is pretty standard in, in the other ordinances that have happened throughout the county to give them that notice. So as we move forward tonight, uh, the staff recommends that we approve the first reading of the ordinance as presented, and that would be to add Capitol Muni Code CMT uh, Chapter 5.38, which is a tobacco retail license. Uh, the second thing would be to repeal Capitol Muni Code Section 8.38.120, and then to amend the language in the, in the Capitol Muni Code 8.38 to comply with the current law. And with that, I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions from council? I do. Um, when you say flavored tobacco, does that absolutely absolutely include menthol as well, or do, do we need to state that in the ordinance itself? No, menthol would be included. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I have none. No? All right, seeing no more council questions, we will open this up for public comment. Is there any members of the public that would like to address the council uh, on this item? Please come on up to the podium. Hello, welcome. Sign your name if you'd like it uh, spelled correctly for the minutes. Cool. Um, good evening. Um, so I'm here mostly because I understand the idea of the flavor ban, but the thing that doesn't go well with it is it's going to take away from harm and prevention and lead more towards fear. It's not going to keep these devices, these juices, these flavors out of the hands of minors. You can go on the internet, anybody can. You could ask somebody to do it for you. Um, basically, my idea is that whole proposition is just going to take away the one option for harm reduction that people like that doesn't give them an odor and honestly doesn't make them feel as bad. Uh, the other big thing, though, that I would consider probably the biggest detriment of passing that whole proposition is the tax revenue that's going to be associated with it. Uh, you mentioned yourself that there's, what, 16 stores in Capitola? That's 16 stores that probably generate over $100,000 in revenue a month, maybe even closer. Yeah, let me take that back. 100000 every six months to 200000 a year and probably even then some. Taxes off of that you could use towards education and actually informing the people instead of taking it away from them. Just my idea. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council this evening on this item? Seeing none. Oh, okay. Hello, welcome. Good evening, honorable council members. My name is Rachel Kippen and I'm the chair of the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Education Coalition. I'm grateful for your attention to this important public health issue and I wanna particularly thank council member Yvette Brooks for initiating this effort. We're here tonight because California is facing a disturbing crisis of teen tobacco use. We've seen the rapid growth of electronic smoking devices and candy flavored tobacco products that appeal to youth. Kid-friendly flavors such as chocolate, mint, and gummy bear make it easier for youth to start smoking and stay with it until they're hooked. In other words, they come for the flavors but get trapped by the nicotine. We are learning more every day about the unique dangers of e-cigs and other flavored products, enough to state with certainty that e-cigs are not a healthy alternative to traditional cigarettes. They are simply a new and different nicotine delivery device. Nicotine is a neurotoxin that harms the developing brain and primes youth for addiction to traditional cigarettes and other substances. This increases their risk of cancer, heart disease, emphysema, and other serious health problems. The tobacco industry knows the vast majority of smokers start before age 18, so they need to get them young. This generation, Capitola's youth, are lab rats in a flavor experiment being run by Big Tobacco. Let's not wait until it's too late to fight back. 
I encourage the city of Capitola to join the city and county of Santa Cruz in banning the sale of flavored tobacco products. The city of Watsonville has also expressed interest in doing so, joining dozens of other California jurisdictions. It is inspiring to see our local policymakers working together and telling Big Tobacco that our children's health is not for sale. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hi, good evening, Council. My name is Tara Leonard, and I'm a health educator with the county's Tobacco Education and Prevention Program. And I want to just clarify a comment that we just heard, because this is a common misconception about what happens with flavored tobacco, that people will argue that it's a valuable quit device or a harm reduction tool. And I'm sympathetic, I really am, because nicotine is a nasty, addictive drug. However, e-cigarettes have not been endorsed by the FDA as a quit device, as numerous other products have. And while personal stories are compelling, good public health policy needs to be based on data. And almost weekly, new studies are coming out that are confirming our very worst fears about these products. Um, one found that 90% of those using e-cigs to quit were in fact still using them a year later. So basically all they're doing is changing, you know, trading one nicotine delivery device for another. Now they will say that it's, it's healthier, right? Well, in fact, more and more studies are showing that they are not healthier. And in fact, just last week, on June 18th, a study was published in the Journal of the American Heart Association. And I'd like to read what they said, because it determined that e-cigarette use is associated with an increased risk of heart attack. Quote, both e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes are independently associated with increased risk of myocardial infarction. Switching from combustible cigarettes to e-cigarettes is not associated with lower risk of myocardial infarction than continuing to smoke. Complete cessation is the only way to reduce risk of myocardial infarction. Another study on May 27th out of Stanford University School of Medicine showed that flavored e-liquids may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease even in the absence of nicotine. This is really important because it shows that the flavoring agents themselves are the ones that cause damage to the blood vessels. While the severity of the damage varied among flavors, quote, cinnamon and menthol were found to be particularly harmful. And that's important because it speaks to your question about the need to include menthol in a flavored ban. Nobody wants people to quit smoking or reduce their harm from these products more than those of us who spend our professional lives as tobacco education and prevention experts. The best way to quit smoking is to never start. And for every person who claims to use a flavored product as a harm reduction tool to quit smoking, there are countless numbers of young people who are using them to start. So I thank you tonight for considering ways to protect the young people of Capitola from ever starting this terrible habit. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hearing our thoughts on this issue. My name is Marina Mays, and I have been a local educator for nonprofits in Santa Cruz County for a very long time. Um, I've worked a lot with the New Brighton uh, Middle School and we, I took a lot of kids to Capitola Beach for beach cleanups and one of the easiest ways to connect children to really big issues was through cigarette butts and as an environmental educator one thing that's really challenging is not only are we introducing kids to really complex ideas like climate change and plastic pollution that can feel overwhelming for an adult who understands it introducing that to children can be really challenging and can feel very much dream killing in a way of all these issues that these children are going to have to face and adding other things like predatory um, ads from tobacco is only adding to the stuff that young children have to deal with that we never really faced such as social media or the financial crisis or economic instability all of these things are going to add up and just taking away this predatory um, nature of the tobacco coalition or sorry the tobacco industry is just going to be one way we can help kids be able to maintain a little bit of happiness in all of the changes that we're facing thank you thank you any other members of the public that would like to address the council on this item hello welcome
Hello. I just wanted to make a couple comments about my story about this whole tobacco industry. I started, unfortunately, when I was young, roughly, probably in high school, as far as I can remember, started with tobacco. Eventually, throughout my age, I went from 16 to 18, started smoking over a pack a day of, what was it? American Spirit Yellow. And before the age restriction went up, I switched over to vaping because I knew what exactly would be in it because they tell you on the bottle, you can look it up, you can do your own research for it, where it's just three different products. And long story short, it's helped me out tremendously. It's, I know there are risks to it. and. So is with everything in life. There's risk in drinking, there's risk in other things. You just need to know how to regulate it. I don't think regulating it this way will be good for the mass public, solely because then people are gonna try to go to sketchy sites or people are gonna try to find ways around it, unfortunately, just because when people want it that badly, they're gonna find a way. And I'm just asking to look it over. And I'm not saying change it all completely. I'm just saying maybe it can be regulated more like a dispensary because people can buy it online too. And you can just easily take your parents' social or your parents' IDs and your credit cards and they can just use them. And that is a sad fact of life that just happens. So just a standard guy from Santa Cruz just asking, please look it over just because I understand where y'all are coming from, but the consequences of taking it completely away is can be drastic if you don't learn from the past history of when you remove something from a society in the past and looking at it back then like prohibition or any other parts of history where you just remove something completely. So thank you for your time. I just want to give a suggestion. Maybe instead of banning it completely, maybe regulate it a little bit more like a dispensary. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna bring it back to the council for further discussion. Councilmember Vatorf, let's start with you. Okay, um, this wasn't my proposal, this was brought by Councilwoman Brooks and I'm glad she did. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a confusing topic for me because one thing I like and one I think I was really glad to hear tonight was uh, I believe strongly in democracy and I believe we should hear from all sides. And it doesn't mean that there's good and bad, it just means we're having a discussion about how things impact us. So I, I do acknowledge that. And I think it's no mystery that my history, my position is, is I'm a big fan of revenue, any kind of revenue that I can provide for this city. So um, when it comes to you know selling items and we take something off the market, there's no doubt that there's additional revenue that we're gonna lose. But on that vein, you know, when we came to uh, legalize the sale of marijuana in this city, I voted against it strongly because I wanted nothing to do with that source of revenue in this city. The problem is that 67% of the voters in Santa Cruz County approved voting for marijuana. So it's called the will of the people. So it's hard for us to come up here and to make decisions and you always have to remember that there is a will of the people. Um, when it comes to this source uh, of revenue, it's one I choose not to uh, tap into and, it, and I'm hopeful that uh, this council chooses not to do that also. We did make a decision to do marijuana dispensaries, and, and like I said, I would rather not any, have anything to do with that funding whatsoever. But for the other example, you know, one thing we also decide not to do is, is we decide not to sell fireworks in this city. Fireworks are a tremendous source of revenue. When there would be taxes on the revenue, it would be beneficial to this city. But what we do in this country is we make choices about what we want to have that surrounds us. And so in this effort, I. Um, I make a choice not to sell this product in this town. Uh, if someone else wants to get the product, they'll have to figure out a way to do it, but it's just something that I would rather isolate and insulate myself from and the residents of the city and say, 
uh, we say no to this product and and uh, I believe that it's beneficial to kids not to be exposed to it so uh, I'm gonna vote no on on uh, or actually what, what are we we're gonna vote yes to initiate this this measure thank you <laughs> thank you councilwoman Brooks um, I too appreciate everyone coming tonight um, to speak on about this this topic one thing that really stood out to me was the comment about revenue and this revenue stream and um, the loss of it but what's more <clears throat> excuse me what's more important to me is is our kids in our community as a parent myself I have a responsibility as a mom to go above and beyond to ensure that there's things around my daughter or there are not things around my daughter um, that she can have access to um, and so not just for my own kid but for the rest of our children in our community this is really important we have an opportunity a unique opportunity to hold ourselves accountable for protecting our, our kids um, so with that I may I make a motion to pass this um, ordinance to I think that's all I have to say I would like to approve the first reading of the ordinance I think that's all I have to say right I'll second that motion all right Oh, well, we have a motion and a second. Um, just for continuation of discussion, I have a couple comments I'd like to say uh, myself. Um, I think this is interesting because, of course, we all know that there are um, matters of, of personal liberty when it comes to deciding what kind of risks we want to take. Um, but for this particular issue, I think of it something uh, similar to uh, the way there are dry counties that choose not to sell alcohol. And I think that what we're doing here is something similar in saying that, yes, you have the right to take that risk, but we as a city don't want to offer that risk to you. Um, and so I am also in support of the motion. So we have a motion and a second. And uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we have, uh, as mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we've moved item uh, 10B for a future meeting. So we're gonna move on to item 10C, discussion of the revised zoning code. Do we have a staff report? Good evening, Council. Reed Gamogli here. Your interim city attorney to discuss with you some of our legal comments and observations, having reviewed the uh, chapter 17.44. Apologies as I flip to it to join you all. My goal this evening is to explain to you from our perspective or from the legal perspective if there are any inconsistencies or uh, suggested revisions that could be problematic for the city as it continues to grow, evolve, and uh, flourish as the city of Capitola does. Uh, starting off is 1744. This is the coastal overlay zone, so the entire chapter 17.44 deals with the regulations of the coastal issues uh, and the coastal act as its implementation there's many other chapters of our zoning uh, title uh, i've talked about a couple of them at the very end and there are some additional chapters that have minor tweaks that are affected by what has been done in 1744 i know that this evening we only have three council members present we'll be coming back as you know uh, later in july and again in september to, to continue discussions on this topic so this is our primer if you will to get everyone grounded as to the major uh, changes that are facing the city potentially and what our thoughts are from the legal side. Uh, and so I'm starting here at chapter 1744, section 010B, which is purpose. And I've got a slide for each one of these. Now, my comment here is pretty straightforward. There was additional language suggested by the Coastal Commission staff uh, to the effect, as you can see up on the slide, that the chapter shall be given the broadest possible interpretation or interpretation possible so as to protect, restore, and enhance the coastal resources. As you can see in some of our comments in my attachment, uh, that's not necessarily consistent with the language of the Coastal Act, which does include a very important caveat of protect, maintain, and where feasible enhance and restore the overall quality of the coastal zone. 
And what you should be aware of is that although this language was not included because the city staff and I believe the Planning Commission rejected that proposed language, when the city followed up with coastal staff, they indicated that they would, if this topic was not in, uh, injected into the zoning ordinance, they would make a recommendation to the Coastal Commission to not approve the city's local coastal plan update unless the language was put back in. So I think this is a, an item that's going to potentially cause some continuing tension. I think it should be identified uh, as an area that staff and uh, the coastal staff, city staff and coastal staff should work collaboratively to see if we can uh, strike an appropriate middle ground. The balance is the, I think, uh, objective uh, desire that we all share to protect our environment, but also uh, maintains our local control and, and consistency with state law. Next section is 17440030. It's not showing up on the slides, but the next section is shown on my attachment is section I. There's a new, this is the definition section. So 17440030 is the definition section. There's several words that were redefined. The first one, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. That's fine. Is, uh, is they defined a new energy facility term. And as written, it's arguable that a private party that put a solar panel on their roof would constitute an energy facility under the coastal development permit. I don't think that was anyone's intention to prohibit somebody from putting solar panels on their roof. But I believe that there could be an argument made based on the text of the language uh, that that would be um, an argument. So I believe staff could work with the Coastal Commission to clarify that. The next section is section Q, which is a slide up on the screen, which is a pretty significant change. The red language was stricken. The green language was added by coastal staff. Now that means that they redefined the word structure to read as follows. As used in this chapter, structure includes but is not limited to any building, road pipe, flume, et cetera. Prior to that, the zoning ordinance had had a modification. And the first sentence that struck in red says an improvement permanently attached to the ground. By removing that limitation or that additional element to define a structure, they greatly broadened potentially the definition of structure. It might encompass something as simple as an umbrella placed on the beach. Again, I don't think anyone has an intent to regulate um, tents that are put out on the beach, but it is arguable and it certainly opens the door for a uh, individual who's aggrieved or an appellant who wants to shut down an event or stop something from happening from raising an argument that then the erection of any structure or this type of work would constitute development and therefore would require a coastal development permit. I don't believe that's what the parties who are negotiating the staff as uh, coastal or city intend, but I believe that should be revisited and discussed uh, as well because it does create some potential for future argument, which can lead to costs for the city in the forms of appeals and litigation. Next item is 1744060 development standards. Now, Coastal staff, again, this is one of those items that the city staff and the city planning commission declined to include in their recommendations to council, but coastal staff indicated as with the prior item, the purpose that they would not uh, support the city's proposal to the coastal commission if that language were not introduced back in. Uh, coastal staff have suggested in their uh, correspondence, they believe this just reiterates and expounds on the tenets of the coastal act, but the language is, is fairly uh, broader than what the coastal act would, would require and what it does is tie the hands of our local agency officials, planning commission and city council with respect to interpreting and using the discretionary authority that's supposed to be vested with the city when the coastal commission uh, vests us with the powers of our own local coastal plan. So this is something that I believe staff, uh, both sides need to come back to the table on for future discussion because this is a at loggerheads, if you will. And if we were to go to Com coastal commission on an approval, the two parties would not be on the same page and that's never beneficial to getting things accomplished. The next item that I've identified is chapter 1744, sorry, section 1744070B5 review authority. Development, again, blue language as shown on the screen is the new language added by coastal staff and the red language is what had been stricken. What this change does is suggests that if development is under a coastal development permit that the Coastal Commission issued, that they should be the one, that the city should be the one to review any proposed amendments to it. That's how the coastal, uh, the local coastal plan currently read. As modified, the last sentence is what's important. Or would be, and this is in the context of 
whether or not the city can rule on a amendment to such a Coastal Commission issued permit, but, but it says unless it would be more appropriately processed through a Coastal Commission authorization. That's very ambiguous language. It doesn't really leave any local authority and discretion or understanding for an applicant of what might happen if they were to propose to make any change or to further develop, um, even in a positive manner, their property. So I would recommend reconsidering uh, this final sentence because it appears to open the door to a little bit more argument about, again, uh, what is more appropriately processed through a Coastal Commission authorization than through city authorizations, which is what the purpose of the local coastal plan is, is to allow the local agency to have decision-making authority. We have it, except if it would be more appropriately processed through a commission authorization. There's no standard guiding that. Without some sort of standard to guide that, you're just opening a door for argument. And uh, objectively, I think uh, people would have a different opinion and they would be uh, fighting about whether or not the city had jurisdiction or the Coastal Commission had jurisdiction. And that's one of the things that you don't want to have any ambiguity over is whose jurisdiction is what. So I would recommend uh, taking a closer look at that and working to try and clean up that language so that there is a little bit of an objective standard or that jurisdictional lines or, or standards exist in a clear way so that the city and applicants and the public understand what their rules and obligations are. 17.44070D, legal development and permitting processes. This slide and the next slide are functionally equivalent, so this is a two for one, we'll go quickly. But essentially, there's legal development and then there's illegal development. And as you may imagine, when we have illegal development, we have to get rid of it. That's pretty standard, that's what we expect in, in most settings. But what we have written in here is, if you look at the red language which was stricken, and the blue language which was added, specifically in the middle, there's red language that says improvements, repair, modification, or additions to suggestion. That is taken out. And now what it says is in order to continue as it legally existed prior to those dates, that's going to create a lot of room for disagreement as to how it existed prior to those dates. Not many great records exist. Uh, or, well, that's not true. Plenty of people keep great records, but not everybody. And when individuals lose records, suddenly there's a ambiguity in our code and finally the last sentence there it was stricken the coastal permit may be approved if the proposed development is consistent with the policies or standards of the city's lcp i think that language is pretty standard and didn't need to be stricken it didn't have to be taken out but what you're looking at is increasing the scope of development over which the coastal staff would claim authority potentially under the coastal act again leaving ambiguity in terms of who has jurisdiction over a, a development process a cdp issuance so if we skip to the next slide, which is just subsection E, illegal development, uh, the same thing here. The proposed amendment increases the potential for arguments about the legality of prior development. This one's really dense, so I won't try and point you to any particular sentence. You'd have to read the whole thing as a holistic uh, reading, but it's the same concept as with what's permitted, what's illegal, when do we determine that? The big issue with this is adding the language of uh, the de illegal development must be abated and any affected areas restored to at least the condition before the unpermitted, but unpermitted development was undertaken, if not better. Again, these are vague, ambiguous words in our zoning ordinance. We can use broad policy language in our general plans, but we don't put them into our zoning ordinances. So again, trying to tie down the language if there's a desire to uh, set a standard for how things must be restored, I think there should be a consideration for a more objective viewpoint because one man's uh, garbage is another man's treasure and here we have the potential for one person to think that it's not uh, what it should have been beforehand. I don't think that this is a, um, this isn't adding any clarity to our code, it's adding more murkiness to the code. And so that's why I'm always, I'm always averse to seeing zoning ordinances that are a little vague. The next section is a long string site, but it's an important one. It's repair and maintenance activities. No coastal development permit shall be required for repair and maintenance activities. This exemption does not include, and, and I want you to look at the last sentence here. The following extraordinary methods of repair and maintenance shall require a coastal development permit because they involve a risk of a substantial adverse environmental impact. 
what they're saying is, is that you don't need a coastal development permit unless there's a substantial uh, risk of substantial adverse environmental impact. I don't think anybody disagrees that we don't want development uh, occurring when there's substantial adverse environmental impact, but what qualifies as substantial adverse environmental impact is going to be subject to a debate between people on the spectrum of ocean protectionism. Uh, I'm very involved in, in protecting the oceans, and I might believe that uh, what is a substantial adverse environmental risk is one thing, whereas an environmental consultant might believe a different thing. So having a bit of a, a more objective standard, some actual measurable criteria, these are the things that I flag for the city because these are areas where an appellant or where an applicant is going to potentially argue and there's not going to be any clarity in the code and when we have no clarity in the code you can end up before the coastal commission or you know for we hope not but in litigation and those are never desirable outcomes for anything 080g emergency work again the red language is stricken the blue language remains this this changes what the city's ability to use emergency uh, work this changes the city's ability to use emergency development permits to conduct emergency work. Po apologies for the, the tongue tying here. I'm looking at this and the red and the blue make it difficult for me to read this sometimes as well. However, such work, this is the last sentence, however, such work must be authorized by an emergency coastal development permit and a follow-up regular CDP pursuant to section 1744170 emergency coastal development permits i flagged this one because what what they're saying is is emergency work is going to be subject to the emergency coastal development permit chapter that chapter has been substantially modified and these are important things because when we do emergency work we're trying to protect something we're trying to repair something we want to have a clear understanding of how it works these two things are interrelated so the next one that we'll touch on we'll, we'll deal with that but first we have a uh, 17441100b challenges to coastal development permit determinations and this is where coastal commission staff requested to include the executive director of the coastal commission which for all intents and purposes is the coastal commission staff of, of the local jurisdiction office to those who have the basis to challenge determinations made by the city um, so it's not just an interested party it's not just an applicant uh, it's now the executive director of the coastal commission and that's not typical it's not what's uh, in in the city's code now and it would represent uh, an incursion into our local discretionary authority uh, and the community development director's discretionary authority to make such determinations now granted um, the coastal commission has jurisdiction over final decisions not interim decisions and this would allow them to inject themselves midway through our processes when normally they have to wait till the end um, that re represents an encroachment on our local control and so I flag that for the city because typically speaking you want your local decisions made locally you want permits finalized and if somebody does want to take an appeal they can do so but ultimately allowing coastal staff to stop a process midway through doesn't seem like a fair shake for the applicant or for the city in terms of discharging what's supposed to be a local uh, discretionary authority given to us by the Coastal Commission. This is another one that coastal staff added, but city staff had rejected in the planning commission, I should say, had rejected. They added an extensive list of what submittal requirements were for applications. Staff uh, indicated in the planning commission indicated a preference. Why don't we allow the city's community development director to continue to set the parameters for what needs to be submitted depending on what kind of project it is and what the city staff believe they need in order to do their jobs best. Uh, there's going to be some individuals who might submit for an application and amongst all the bullet points that were included by staff most of them would be overkill for the project so uh, i think allowing local discretion here is is probably appropriate coastal staff has not indicated whether or not they have a problem with this yet so i think we should circle back with them to see whether um, we can retain our local discretion on what we believe we need to see when we are contemplating an application Appeal fees, and this is an item that I discussed with our community, uh, community development director. Coastal staff had proposed bypassing the appeals process, or if there's any fees, including design permit or conditional use permit fees charged as part of an appeal. Uh, as you can see in the attachment that uh, is a, with the late uh, additional materials, any appeal that's submitted in conjunction with another permit requires a fee due to the cost. The city has a lot of costs associated with conducting the appeal, and so uh, prohibiting coastal development permit appeal fees seems reasonable, but telling the city it can't charge a fee for these very substantial appeals that involve a lot of staff time, 
uh, and involve a lot of public money to, to go through doesn't seem appropriate. Um, one more time, Jamie. Oh, I see that that was a duplicate slide. Apologies for that. There is a section that is uh, 160A2 that should have been in here. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh, again, the language is internally inconsistent. There's a first blue, first blue sentence. The second blue sentence, if you will, says, of Coastal Commission receipt of a complete notice of final action. The final sentence says the 10-day working appeal period shall start the day after Coastal Commission receives adequate notice of the city's final local action. Those are different standards. Within the statute, it should be a similar standard. Um, typically speaking, receipt is not the standard uh, for when a um, receipt of a complete notice certainly would be a, a reasonable standard. But when it's, when it's coupled with the requirement that the city, uh, the Coastal Commission receive adequate notice, opens the door to argument that there was no adequate notice, even if they actually received a complete notice. We recommended, and, and I believe I talked this over with uh, the community development director, we would recommend that they work with Coastal Commission staff to bring those two in line, to read the same, to say simply uh, receipt of or notice of the city's final lo local action, but not have both terms interchangeably used within the same uh, subsection of the statute. 170D, well, Coastal Commission staff, you'll see right there the first sentence in red, they are removing or other designated local official, which would basically mean that the only person who could uh, preside over an emergency CDP issuance would be the community development director. Well, God forbid Katie wants to go on vacation sometime because typically speaking, that's what people do or they get sick or they have family affairs that they have to attend to. We would prefer to have the same uh, language that we have always had and what the Coastal Commission's um, staff has indicated is a change to that and it's not consistent with the Coastal Act because the Coastal Act provides for a appropriate local official the city should have the authority to designate that official and not be constrained to assemble one individual with one figurehead title. While important, they're not always available for a variety of good reasons. And if there was an emergency, we wouldn't want to not be able to act because that person wasn't around. The remaining language there uh, is, is generally not objectionable to the city. I would note the final sentence says that the coastal development or com community development director shall consult with the coastal commission as time allows in determining whether to issue an emergency CDP. That's not ever been required beforehand. It's not typically a requirement, you know, particularly with emergency CDPs, the point of having a local coastal plan is that the local city can take action and the local city can make determinations of that nature. Uh, it doesn't prohibit the city from doing that. It simply says they shall consult, but it is an additional burden, an additional obligation that's never been there. And it's inconsistent with generally what we expect, which is once we have a local coastal uh, plan updated and certified, that the city can discharge it without having to continually check in with the mothership, so to speak. 170F, this was an interesting one. Uh, new criteria for granting an emergency permit that was added. The proposed work is the minimum amount of temporary development necessary to abate the emergency in the least environmentally damaging manner. That again, who's going to disagree and agree about what the minimum amount of work is I think you can appreciate depending on where somebody sits what their um, particular motives are if you propose to put up something they don't think it's just the minimum right and you're going to have an argument about that and if you have jurisdictional ambiguity and the city staff believes that the proposed work is the minimum amount but the coastal staff disagrees or another appellant or another interested party disagrees and they want to challenge it this language could be used to create confusion and to sow debate and it would essentially make it a lot more difficult for everybody to have a clear understanding of what their obligations are under our local coastal plan. We want our zoning ordinance to read clear. We want everyone to pick up the book with consulting with a lawyer to know what they have to do. This does not allow that to happen. So I would suggest that this item be considered to be removed, but I think that you know, for the, the thrust of it, which is to protect the environment, do the least amount of work in the least damaging manner. That, that makes sense, but I believe that should be a discretionary decision uh, that the community development director, the local enforcement official, should have the discretion to rule on. I'm not finding that language. I'm not, I'm not if I'm on a different page. 44-25. 44-170F, they're talking about. Number. When it says criteria for granting permit. Yes, it's the very, la so if you number go to subsection five. G below it, it's number five right above it. Okay, got it. That, Thank you for that. Since I've got you on G, we'll slip right there. Okay. 
which is the conditions for granting an emergency CDP. The emergency development authorized is only temporary and can only be allowed to remain provided a regular CDP is obtained to recognize it. I don't think anyone disagrees that if you get an emergency CDP, you're supposed to finalize it. That's what the Coastal Act calls for, but the Coastal Act says you can do that later. What it says here is absent a regular CDP, the development shall be removed and the affected area restored to pre-emergency conditions or better. Again, I'm not quite sure what that means, but within six months of an emergency CDP issuance, meaning that if there was a disagreement between, um, say, the applicant and the city about the scope of the work, that they, there's a really ticking clock that pushes people to make decisions in a short time frame. It doesn't allow the members of the community who might have been impacted by the development to take you know, an appropriate response. They'll be in a rushed position. Uh, the Coastal Act permits it to be done later. Um, I think that the city could talk to coastal staff and see about returning to our prior iteration of the code where we have the discretion to take enforcement actions. If somebody's sitting on their hands and refusing to play ball, we can take appropriate enforcement action. That's what our, uh, our ordinances call for. However, putting a, a running shot clock on somebody doesn't necessarily appreciate the realities of trying to work through uh, repairs uh, in the coastal zone and the time it takes, the studies that are necessary, the biological consults, uh, meeting with all of the involved agencies, uh, including state and federal, as applicable. The next subsection is F, limitations. This one just concerned me because this is a big change. They struck the word structure and changed it to infrastructure. Again, I don't disagree that we shouldn't be doing emergency work on non-essential items, but an essential public structure is different than an essential public infrastructure. Infrastructure might arguably be limited to sewer, water, maybe roads, but I can tell you some people disagree about whether roads are essential public infrastructure, particularly in the coastal zone, uh, especially when it comes to the managed retreat policies that are being discussed at the state level. So I would recommend not changing that language. Um, essentially, an essential public structure is different from an essential public infrastructure, and it's a matter of opinion as to what the difference is, but structure is broader than infrastructure. And again, they redefined the term structure. So I don't like when a, a definition word changes, uh, you, you have to think about the ripple impact that'll have throughout the code. And so a lot of these things I'm flagging, you'll hear me harken back to because the impact here, uh, for example, is the wharf an essential public infrastructure? It's not infrastructure in the traditional sense, but it's an essential public structure. It has a lot of value. It's important to the city and to the community. We should look at these kind of considerations when we uh, determine what the limitations of where we can do emergency CDP work are. Reed, <clears throat> can you make sure we add that to, it's missing from your the report that came to us, item H for limitations. We don't have H. In, You're in right, I did double G. And it's, uh, it's it the is? second G, I apologize. There's a lot of letters and numbers in here. And There's a lot. Yes, that's why we're doing this in many phases. We'll be back again to talk more. The next subsection is I. Yeah, thank you. Application for regular CDP. Again, the last section here, all the new language says that is considered temporary, all emergency development work, and again, the six-month shot clock that I talked about earlier. Now, it does say here, unless the community development director authorizes an extension of time for good cause, but it doesn't say that in the prior section. So again, you have inconsistency in your code, and again, you're putting a shot clock on somebody when that might not be appropriate, and there might take a lot longer, it might take a lot longer time to get all the parties, including all the biologists and the affected agencies with jurisdiction on the same page. This one is outside of chapter 44, but as I just mentioned to you, the ripple effect that occurs. Uh, so we'll be talking about this one at a future hearing in more detail, but I wanted to flag it for discussion tonight as well. There's a section of the code that deals with encroachments. If somebody wants to do encroachment work in the right of way and for the uninitiated encroachment work is when you have to go dig a trench in the street to run a new sewer line, or if you need to block the sidewalk to tear it up to run a new sewer line, or if you're doing some sort of repairs that re require you to encroach in the public right of way. The final additional sentence here is the with the final additional, sorry, with the additional findings, so again, encroachment permits are required and they can only be approved with additional findings that the encroachment does not restrict lateral and vertical public coastal access, does not obstruct public coastal views, and does not impact ESHA. 
What I will tell you is that if somebody went out in the street and was doing encroachment work out in the Capitola Village and they blocked the sidewalk, that would be restricting lateral public coastal access. You couldn't make the finding as it's written here. Or at least there's a very good argument you can't make the finding. And if you were to make the finding, somebody could appeal it and argue that's a restriction on lateral public access. You can't grant that encroachment permit work. I think we identified this with staff that there are some scenarios that we recognize would be appropriate uh, to have a requirement that encroachment work uh, not restrict lateral and vertical public access or obstruct public coastal views, specifically a neighborhood up on Depot Hill. Uh, but this, this breadth of this language would sweep up the scenario I just described, which is anything in the Capitola Village or other on the Stockton Bridge um, that would restrict lateral coastal access. You couldn't make a finding to do encroachment work under that scenario. So I think this should be revisited with coastal staff. I think the parties are on the same page, but I think the language needs to be fine-tuned to reflect what the intent is behind the proposed amendment, which I think in this instance, um, although written with probably the best intentions, it swept in some work that we would not want to have an additional finding of that nature uh, required. The final section of my comments for this evening is in the visitor serving parking subsection of our code and where it is uh, about halfway through the paragraph you'll see uh, it says the city shall ensure existing levels of public access are at least maintained and if possible enhanced including by providing alternative access so when there's a potential uh, impact on a public coastal access the city has to maintain public par public parking opportunities i'm not sure that the city can in good faith make that commitment uh, sea level rise storm surges there may be loss of parking with development. We're encouraging alternative usage of transportation like e-vehicles, e-bikes, ride sharing for the purposes of reducing you know, carbon emissions and hopefully reducing sea level rise or mitigating it to some extent. Uh, requiring the city to ensure existing parking exists uh, at all places is a bit troublesome. Uh, and I don't know that the city wants to make that commitment. So I think that maybe discussing this again with coastal staff to see if we can strike middle ground would be advisable, but it does uh, it also, you'll see it in the middle of it, um, it restricts the city's ability to adjust parking fees, timing and availability. It's typically a municipal affair. Uh, it's something that falls squarely within the city's jurisdiction to deal with its own parking issues. I know it's become a matter of statewide concern and unfortunately the Coastal Commission's various local regional offices haven't taken a statewide consistent approach to that issue. So I would suggest that the city work with them to make sure that we all are on the same page and understand what we're being obligated to do. Uh, I know that I might be, uh, you know, I was just in Hawaii and I was told by the boat captain that because of their tectonic plate location and sea level rise, they're losing half of a foot a year his harbor is going to be gone in five years that he works out of. I don't know what 15 years and 20 years of uh, sea level rise will do to the city of Capitola. But what I do know is that if we're obligated to maintain parking at the Esplanade and it's underwater, that's going to be an awkward thing. And I look to the way future uh, when we update our zoning codes because these things stick around for about 30 years at a time. And so that's the kind of mentality we have to have when we look at this kind of language. So uh, those are my comments for this evening. If you have specific questions, please raise them now. I'm also happy to meet with you further to talk about these impacts and strategies for addressing a collaborative approach to getting the city zoning code, which is in desperate need of an update, uh, to get updated. But at the same time, the city needs to protect itself against uh, binding itself to commitments that it can't really make or it can't really discharge down the line um, just because of the pragmatic realities. And also recognizing that we are a city and we're, we're giving a LCP it's because we're supposed to discharge it so we should be in control of it to the most uh, the most reasonable extent possible and I, I know that the council is of the same mindset in terms of we do want to protect our environment so the question is how do we get there uh, without losing local control and without making promises that we ultimately may not be able to keep thank you quite a mouthful I know. <laughs> uh, any questions from council council member Brooks um, I don't have any specific questions about what was what you reported on. I'm more curious about next steps. Um, you've mentioned that we have the opportunity to meet one-on-one, -on -one, but if if you don't mind, I'll uh, I'll let the community Thank development you. director Jamie, step in. Thank you. Uh, pop sure. up the slide. So I have one slide on next steps. Um, so our August, we were planning on continuing this to the August meeting, but our August meeting is quite full. 
due to the uh, decrease in meetings over the summer. So we're going to suggest tonight to continue this to the September 12th meeting in which we're going to begin. Um, first, we can come back with an updated draft based on the guidance we've been given by the city attorney tonight. So a clean draft of uh, those modifications. Also starting to discuss the policy items. So the first two during the September 12th meeting that I'd like to bring forward is a discussion on village parking and also a discussion on the village hotel height. And then followed by a meeting on September 26th to discuss the Monarch Cove Inn. And we'll um, notice these appropriately since they're highly sensitive items that uh, the public has been interested in. And then any additional council item uh, discussion items that you would like on the September 26th meeting so that's where we're headed and that's different from what was in the staff report originally and tonight we're recommending a continuation on the discussion of the zoning code update to the September 12th meeting thank you can can we have that email to or can I have that email to me thank you do you have any additional questions I have no questions at this time councilmember Bator no questions no questions all right um, we will bring it to public comment then. Is there any member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Hello. Hello. Good evening again. Uh, first, I would like to thank the city attorney for his work. Uh, I thought it was very clear and easy to understand and um, is very helpful in trying to go through this kind of process. Uh, I would also like to encourage the council um, this it's, it's an interesting process our staff working with the Coastal Commission staff and as uh, in all cases you know sort of staff working with staff staff people change the interpretations change and as council members uh, you've often had staff bring you an idea a proposal or a project where the City Council decided that uh, they had a better approach to it than what the staff was offering you. And I'm saying that because I encourage you to adopt uh, your final ordinance that represents what the city of Capitola wants uh, and to not be intimidated by the Coastal Commission staff saying, well, we're not going to recommend approval of it because we've all seen even the Coastal Commission approve things differently from what their staff has recommended. So I urge you to do what is best for the city of Capitola and Capitola's residents. And I compliment Katie because I know this is a very difficult position that she's in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? All right. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello, T.J. Welch. I really don't have anything new to add other than I, I do want to commend uh, Reed for his work and diligence. And uh, there, it gets so convoluted between the edit sometimes trying to figure out uh, where we go with this. But I think you did a great job. I appreciate Katie and the staff working through this. And uh, you know, I would just also jump on the bandwagon of saying that let's not be intimidated by the Coastal Commission. They're, they're an agency that's out there. but. Um, really other than the Coastal Act they just have policies and and what we're seeing if, if you follow any of the uh, stuff going to the Supreme Court on other agencies regulatory type agencies is, is they're losing right now on overreaching and overstepping so uh, let's just hang in there I think uh, Reed's doing a great job and I think our staff will take us in the right direction so thanks for your time and effort thank you any additional comment from members of the public Seeing none, uh, we will bring it back for council discussion. Council Member Brooks. Sure. Um, so I would just encourage staff to continue working collabor collaboratively with the Coastal Commission on, on these edits. Um, I know that it's important. I appreciate the, the hard work that Reed and you have put into this, Katie. So um, that's the only encouragement that I, I have to, to just make sure we find a good balance with um, with and how we move forward with all of this. Thank you, Council Member Bautorf. Um, my question is, are you looking for direction for us or some kind of consensus or some kind of way to proceed? Because I'm willing to initiate some kind of action like that if, um, 
It, it's my intention after hearing all the, you presented us with 21 different items and they all seem to be valid and make sense and protect our position. And I think they're inconsistent with, with the, the will of the people of Capitola. Um, I don't know how this is gonna go back. It seems to me like this is into a negotiation method. And so, you know, what, what, what I'm leaning towards here is that I just, I'd like to get consensus of the council and, and pass that on to you to, uh, you know, direct you to proceed with, uh, with your continued negotiations to the items that you brought to us to carry that position on and continue. I don't, I don't want you to feel like you have to wait for us to come back in September to tar start discussing these items. I think they're all valid and I'm willing to, to make a recommendation that, that we proceed with a consensus on those items. So I'll, I'll field that, which is uh, I think the direction that you could give would be just as you said, to continue working with our collaborative uh, efforts with the coastal staff to try and reach that middle ground that we believe exists, um, recognizing the shared interests that everybody has. Um, in addition, I think, you know, we only have three out of five council members here and in respect for the two who aren't here, um, we won't take any extreme hard line positions that won't be able to be negotiated in the course of our discussions because I think it'd be fair to have their input as well. Um, I don't know, we had mentioned, I think, earlier about coming back in July, um, but that's September. not happening. So, yeah. so we're gonna keep it to September, in which case we will consult with the other two uh, council members um, if they have the opportunity to read these materials and have questions, I'll answer those questions for them as well. But I think uh, giving direction for staff tonight to continue working with the coastal staff, taking uh, and building off of these comments and, and with the, if, if you're in uh, general consensus here that the comments are, uh, ones that you generally understand and support where we're coming from with our concerns. Uh, we can work with the uh, coastal staff to alleviate those and then return to you with a product that um, to the extent that we can negotiate it, we'll negotiate it. And to the extent that um, it's not negotiable, we'll present you with options, um, option A, which is our way, or option B, which is their way. And the city council can make its final determination at that point. Sure. Uh, some of these may be low hanging fruit, I don't know. Uh, and, and others may be more complicated, but. Uh, I hate to see it just waste time, you know, wait time when you could be having the conversation. There's 21 items. So, you know, at least some of them you may come back and, and, and then the full council would be able to, if we wanted to, to really dig in on those, that would be a different discussion. But that would be my recommendation. So are you looking for a vote from us or will a consensus suffice? I think a consensus approach is fine this evening. Okay. Does the council have? Sure, with one addition. So if I, if I may reiterate, so to continue the rec um, continue discussion on the zoning code on September 12th with the um, draft, it would be in draft form with the modifications you've suggested today. Um, the only addition that I'd be interested in seeing, and maybe that's us meeting offline, Reed, but is to see what, um, how those modifications would potentially change or change the rest of the LCP if there's anything because we just reviewed chapter 17.44 but I'd be interested in seeing what the outcome of these or what the effects of these changes would be on for the rest of the, the code absolutely I'll make sure to flag any um, of that ripple effect in the other chapter seven title 17 has you know I don't know 60 80 chapters 90 chapters to it I can't this wait only, to read it. This is only one chapter. Can't and, wait. And uh, the rest of them are very detail oriented. And there's, uh, you know, little comments I've seen here or there. I didn't bring them today because they're more of the ripple effect, right? You can talk about the symptom, but I talk about what the problem is and if it's originating from 4-4. Uh, well, at least, excuse me, I'm sorry, the, at least the two areas that you've mentioned in your report that we didn't get. Absolutely. And I'll, and I'll be sure to bring any additional ones that we identify as we continue to work with coastal staff to try and reach that middle ground. Thank you. All right. Do we have a consensus among the council for our direction for staff moving forward? I'm in. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, item 10D, considering an administrative policy on social media use by city council and advisory board members. Hello. Hello. Sure. Good evening, council and vice mayor. Thank you. One second. Thank you. Okay. So, 
This presentation is about the proposed policy for social media use by elected and appointed officials. And staff uh, believed that this was a good idea to establish best practices for social media, to provide guidance for um, people such as yourselves, um, to ensure that your online behavior still allows you to participate in city decisions and decision making that's about city business, but also keeps everyone out of trouble, which is always a good thing. So uh, we are not here to try to revoke anyone's rights. We're not taking anything away. We want to acknowledge that the Constitution's First Amendment does protect freedom of speech, which includes your freedom of speech on social media. Um, but the policy is designed to just acknowledge that complications can arise with problematic social media use. So we're going to kind of go over what that might be in order to nip that in the bud rather than have to react to any problematic behavior online. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Brown Act because um, any appointed official, any council member, any committee member that is regulated by California's Brown Act is who this policy is written for. So we're all pretty familiar, but the Brown Act is a California law that um, discusses how to conduct public meetings and is designed to promote open and transparent government. We can all agree that's a positive thing. We want to keep that going and um, basically talks about how actions should be taken openly, deliberations should be made in open meetings. So those are the people covered by this policy. What is this policy covering? Well, social media, obviously. So the policy is defining social media as any online forum or community that allows individuals to post information and to receive information. So right now, that might be Facebook and Instagram. We don't know what that's going to be a few years from now. It also still covers MySpace, Snapchat, Nextdoor. Anything like that is covered. That's all social media in the eyes of this policy. And another important point is that whether or not you have an account on that social media that directly links you back to the city and your alias is Mayor Jane Doe or you're having a private family-based account and you go by Janie, both of those accounts really should follow these same guidelines. So just to keep that in mind, all social media and all different types of accounts are covered. So that's who and what we're talking about, but what is the content of the policy itself? There are different types of city hearings, as I'm sure you're aware. We have quasi-judicial and legislative. The different type of hearing affects the way you should talk about it online. So quasi-judicial really apply rules to one individual, one project, or one circumstance, whereas legislative discusses public policy rules that apply to groups or lots of different people. So if you're confused or you're having, you're not sure which is which, you can think to yourself, does my decision right now affect one or many? So this chart is really the meat of the policy itself, and I'm not going to read it to you, but it's set up as a visual representation to show, you know, going from the left to the right, what is acceptable, what's encouraged, what might be okay, what's probably not a great idea, and what's completely against the policy. And then the second row really talks about okay, so you've, you've made this action, what do you now further have to do if you've made that decision and you've, you've done this online? And we're going to talk, I have some examples here. So encouraged engagement. We're not trying to get you off social media. Social media can be great. So there are things that we're excited about you doing online. These are two examples taken from, um, from real local people, not local, but um, different jurisdictions. Um, one is discussing a monsoon warning. So information that's pertinent to the public and is, that you're sharing, that's fantastic. Definitely, go for it. Another is discussing city budgets in Arizona, sharing an article that was written. Again, not a problem. Um, you know, liking, sharing, reposting this type of content that's more about that legislative type of hearing isn't an issue. 
When you get to commenting, you can run into a problem. Again, bringing it back to the Brown Act, you don't want to accidentally start a serial meeting. You don't want multiple council members commenting about something that really should be discussed in a public forum and not online outside of a public meeting. Um, so that brings us to some discouraged engagement. These are examples. These were made up, so no, one, no one's in trouble. This isn't something that someone actually posted. Um, the first example, I, I don't know if you can see that, um, is discussing a potential, um, a new public park. So something that you would be discussing at a meeting. In this example, a council member is discussing with the public, what do you think about this, this new idea? Off the top of your head, it's probably not that big of a problem. It's great to get, you know, to get the public to tell you what they want. That's why you're here. But any one of those comments in this example is considered ex parte communication and should really be provided in the public meeting for everybody to be on the same page to then discuss and make a decision about that item. So the content and the intention of that post isn't a problem. It's just, again, you've made the post. Now what is your extra action to make sure everything is presented in a public way? The second example is a, a lot more problematic, um, is a clearly biased mayor commenting on a quasi-judicial hearing, an upcoming vote that's already made up their mind. They're discussing their decision ahead of the meeting and is soliciting, again, public opinion on that decision and has, has garnered a lot of likes and comments that, again, are considered ex parte communication. So showing bias on a quasi-judicial decision is absolutely against the policy and would, consequently, that mayor would need to recuse themselves from that vote, which ultimately, this policy is designed to protect members of these boards and councils because you're here because you want to make those decisions. You want to represent the public. You don't want to have to recuse yourself and no longer participate because of something you did online. So just another a list of more of that problematic engagement. Again, highlighting if multiple council members are having online conversation, you could create a serial meeting and violate the Brown Act something you don't want to do. It, it's a pretty common thing and can happen accidentally, but it still can be an issue. And then again, showing bias, posting content regarding quasi-judicial hearings and commenting on those hearings is against the policy. So now that you have an idea of why and what the policy pertains to, our recommendation is to approve the policy, elected and appointed officials use of social media, and at the same time revoke a policy from 2007 which really only fo focused on council members and blogging. So this is a much more comprehensive social media policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from council members? I, have, I, I do have one. Um, can you just what is an administrative policy? What's the difference between an administrative policy and one of our other policies? So we have a series of administrative policies that govern all kinds of things. And in some cases, it's a policy that helps guide the issuance of a permit that's outlined in the municipal code. In other cases, it's a purchasing policy. In other cases, it's how we um, maybe travel to conferences and staff. So. All of these, we have this whole series of administrative policies. There's really two classes of administrative policies, ones that are approved by council, and those really are sort of higher level things. In this case, this would be a council approved policy because you're really imposing a policy on yourselves and your other appointed bodies. And additionally, additionally we have um, administratively, or city manager staff approved policies that are really governing our internal operations. So those are sort of the two categories of administrative policies we have. Okay, thank you. Any no questions? questions? All right. Uh, with no more council questions, we will bring it to the public. Is there any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we will bring it back for further discussion. Councilmember Baltorf? I think it's a great idea, long overdue. I appreciate the effort put into uh, devising this. We were having a couple incidents where we were probably on the edge. Uh, I don't think we crossed that line, but I think we got out in front of this, so uh, I'm going to support this. 
Councilmember Brooks? Yeah, I mean, what an interesting time that, that we've come to to have to create such a policy. It's really interesting and there's such new verbiage with social media. Um, I appreciate this coming forward. Um, I do ask that uh, since this is the first reading, if we can have, it is not the first reading, sorry. Administrative policies are uh, approved without a second reading. So, uh, Reed, were you able to look at this? Yes, I did. I worked with uh, with Chloe regarding the uh, limitations on this. We talked about the rights of free speech. I, I have had a chance to read it. I didn't see any legal issues with it. We're trying to provide a framework, uh, and this actually helps provide that framework. You know, the major concern here is having a decision of the uh, council or the planning commission, you know, fill in the blank, overturned because uh, some individual um, got a bunch of ex parte communications, you know, in the, in the form of social media. They weren't shared an applicant who's aggrieved or a party who didn't like the, the granting of that yeah. is aggrieved and decides to allege that there's been a, an inappropriate behavior and a violation. And whether or not that gets upheld or not, it could slow the process down, doesn't look good for anybody involved. So having at least some parameters, some, um, okay. some guardrails around the road to keep us from careening into a ditch. And since this is an ever-changing area, social media in and of itself, do we need to add anything in the policy that states that we revisit it annually or anything like that? I mean, since it, I mean, it, tomorrow could be a new Facebook or, you know, or. You could, just, you could just at that next meeting say you'd like to add an item for agenda, which is to talk about um, the implications of blank book uh, right. to our new social media yeah. policy. That we just might not be aware of a year from now. I'm just concerned that this is a... Th this, this can always be tweaked. Right. Yeah, okay. this can always be tweaked. I think one of the things to keep in mind about this is, interestingly, we went out looking. Whenever you're writing an administrative policy in a city, you always go and look for other ones that other cities have done. You know, that's just sort of what we do. And we went looking for a policy about that that did this sort of thing in other cities, and we couldn't find one throughout the state. It was really interesting. Everyone's administrative policy said don't violate the Brown Act, or they looked like our old policy about blogs. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> your point is well taken, and that was one of the things when we were writing this, we were trying to think about it like as evergreen language. Like, okay, we're talking about everything here. It's like online forums where people create communities and communicate. And hopefully, we've done it in a way that's going to be resilient for a little bit of time. Right. Um, but I think you're right. I think that this is going to be language we're going to have to revisit over Yeah, because it could be different. Next door could be called something different. Right, like or maybe it's all virtual or, reality or somehow. Yeah. Okay, and, 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 great. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I wanted to be sure of. Thank you. All right, any further discussion from the council? No. I'll go ahead and make a motion that we, uh, I, I appreciate the effort of this, and I think the fact that we didn't take it from somebody else and we created it ourselves is a compliment, so. Uh, People are gonna copy ours now. I, well, that's what I'm saying, this, this could <laughs> be that. So I'll make a motion that we uh, approve staff recommendation. I'll second. We have a motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. All right, we're gonna move on to item 10E, consideration of the 1920, uh, excuse me, 2019-2020 salary schedule. And before we get into this item, I have a statement that needs to be read. Uh, before the City Council this evening, as part of agenda item 10E, is a recommendation to approve adjustments to the City of Capitola salary schedule for all employee groups, including the Association of Capitola Employees, Confidential, Mid-Management, Capitola Police Officers Association, Police Captain, and at-will management employees. The at-will management employees consist of department heads and the City Manager. The salary schedule before the City Council include a 2.25% salary increase July 1, 2019 for the listed groups, including all at-will management. The City health care contribution for employees will be adjusted as well. At-will management adjusted by up to $51 per month. And with that, if we could get a staff report. Thank you, Vice Mayor Peterson. Um, I just want to reiterate the what, uh, what was orally reported. Um, this is uh, a new requirement since 2017 that any time um, there's any change in salary or benefit to management employees, it has to be orally reported and be part of the general government. Um, in 2018, the city employees um, agreed on MOUs. Those MOUs included a 2.25% salary adjustment in July of this year. Um, it also included health care contributions from the city to be increased. Um, management employees, um, at will will receive the same salary adjustments, the 2.25 as the other employees, and will receive health care contribution increases of up to $51 a month, depending off its employee, employee plus one or employee plus two. Um, and I am here to answer any questions. All right. 
Uh, any questions from the council? I have none. No. I have none. No questions. All right. Any uh, member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, we'll bring it back for council discussion. Councilmember Bautour. Uh, motion to approve staff recommendation. I'll second. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, before we adjourn, I would like to request a quick moment of silence in memory of Noel Smith. Thank you. Um, and with that, we will adjourn in the memory of Noel Smith. Have a good night. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other.